Good morning. This morning's scripture is found in Mark chapter 12, verses 1 to 12, on page number 848 in the Bibles under the chairs in front of you. And he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a pit for the wine press and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season came, he sent a servant to the tenants to get from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Again, he sent to them another servant, and they stroked him on the head and treated him shamefully. And he sent another, and him they killed. And so with many others, some they beat, some they killed. He has still one other, a beloved son. Finally, he sent him to them, saying, they will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. And they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read the scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And they were seeking to arrest him, but feared the people, for they perceived that he had told the parable against them. So they left him and went away. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Valentina. Good morning, everybody. Good to see you today. Glad you're uh, going to be part of what's happening here at Foothill Church today. Um, so we're in Mark chapter 12, and uh, Jesus is going to tell us a story. And let me just kind of give you a little context to help you understand why he does this. Remember last week, um, he, he's now in Jerusalem. This is the last week of his life. The, his, um, his arguments with the authorities, the religious leaders, is coming to a head. And last week, he kind of went head to head with them. They asked him a question. He asked back. says, I won't answer your question because you won't answer mine. And, um, and now he, he pauses and he, he tells a story. Now, now, why does he do this? Jesus tells stories uh, on occasion, and um, uh, sometimes he, he's doing it to shift uh, our perspective, their perspective. Um, maybe somebody, you've said to somebody or somebody said to you, I wish you could see things through my eyes. I wish you could see things as I see them. And so maybe an illustration or something sometimes can help us feel and understand uh, something from somebody else's perspective. Well, what Jesus wants to do here is he wants us to understand uh, something from God's perspective. Okay, now, now that's a big task, right? Because we have these little three-pound pea brains in comparison to God, and we have sinful propensities and, and wicked hearts, and so he's got to try to tell us a story to help us see things, to help us uh, unveil our eyes so that we understand. But he also, he tells these stories sometimes so that we see things from a new perspective, but we feel some things, and I, and I hope you'll see and feel the things that Jesus wants us to do here. This is called a parable, right? It says he starts to speak to them in parables. What is that word? A parable isn't just a story. A parable, literal, it literally means in the Greek to, to lay alongside, okay? So you'd take something and lay it here and something and lay it here, and you would compare the two. And by comparing them, you would understand something better. That's what's happening with these parables. So, so Jesus uses these parables, laying two things alongside of each other so that there's this truth, and it's pointing to a bigger truth that he wants us to see. Okay, now, what we're going to see today is this is an intense parable, Okay, I mean, it, this is, there are some hard things that we need to hear. And I've said this before, but, but I believe this, that, that sometimes we need to hear hard things to produce soft hearts. I believe that hard things help produce a soft heart. I don't mean cowardly heart. You understand what I mean here? Soft truths produce hard hearts. And we want to have soft hearts toward the things of God. And so there's going to be some things that Jesus says that are hard for us to hear. And while the immediate application, I believe, is the religious leaders and what's happening in Israel at that time, there's obviously a broader application uh, to you and me. Now, like any story, what we want to do, I was an English major, and so, you know, we always had to analyze stories and, and things like that when I was in college. And, and, uh, but, but like any story, what you want to understand is, of course, the arc of the story. That is, what's the, what's the big idea? What's happening? How does the story flow? But then you also want to try to get down and understand some of the details of that story. 
So I think the arc of this is pretty clear, right? We got this man, he plants a vineyard, he does everything, gets it all set up, leases it out to some tenants. Tenants come along, they start producing fruit, everything's going well. He comes to collect rent, they say no, they beat up everybody that he sends their way, finally kills their son. He says, you know, you're all going down. Okay, that's kind of the arc of the story, right? But the details, let's try to see how Jesus lays alongside the truth, this, this story, and say, what is this pointing to? Okay, what are these, what are the details pointing to? So let's start reading in verse 1 of chapter 12. And he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a pit for the wine press, built a tower, leased it to tenants, and went into another country. So right there, we are introduced to almost every character and scene that we need to know about. So let's ask some questions about that. Number one, who's this owner? What's it pointing to? Okay, the owner, he's this guy. He, he doesn't just own this plot of land. He actually plants the vineyard, okay? He plants it, he builds a fence, digs a pit for the wine press. He builds a tower for the vine dressers to keep watch over the vineyard. He comes, he, he, he owns the vineyard, and he makes all the preparations so that this would be a successful vineyard, so that this would be something that would actually produce fruit. And then he leases it out to these tenants. So who is this guy? Okay, what's the comparison we're supposed to draw? This is God. This is the Father. Okay, uh, He made the world and everything in it, right? Everything in the heavens and earth is yours, O Lord, and this is your kingdom, David says in 2 Chronicles. Okay, He made it for his glory, for our joy, and he made it in such a way that as we steward what he's given to us, then he is glorified and we're satisfied. It's an amazing transaction that God does for us. See, see, wherever you live, part of the application for us is this. It all belongs to God. There's nothing you own, there's nothing you have that is yours. Now, I know we talk like this, and, and that's fine. You can talk about this, you want to see my car, you want to see my house, you know, whatever. You, but, but at bottom, it's not mine, it's not yours, it's God's. And when I really start to believe that it's mine, I'm in trouble. Um, so my body is his My cars are his. My house is his. My career is his. My children are his. It's all his. It all belongs to to, to him. So so it doesn't matter, you know, it's not like just just the world belongs to him. Every neighborhood belongs to him. Every house, every trailer, every car, whatever. It all belongs to him. And it's a gift that he intends for us to use uh, through a life that pleases him. Now, we're going to find out in verse 6 that this man, this owner, is actually a father. And he has a beloved son. He has a son he, he loves very, very much. Now, this is going to start to help you. What I said, you're going to start to feel some things, and I want you to feel this with me, okay? Because over and over in Scripture, God is referred to as a father, right? Jesus prays, our Father who art in heaven. I mean, over and over, you're going to see this image. And I know for some of you, that is not a pleasant image. You say, I had a horrible dad, or, you know, my dad was very abusive to me, whatever the case is. Yes, but even if you did, I can almost guarantee you dreamt about the daddy you would hope for. That, that's God. If you had a great dad, he's better than that. Okay? He's dad. He's, he, and and he, look, at, look at all he does for his children. He provides for us. Okay? It says he plants a vineyard. He doesn't just say, here's a nice plot of ground. Now make it fruitful. He actually does the planting. He ensures its fruitfulness. He puts fences around it. Okay? I'm going to make sure that, you know, why would you put a fence around a vineyard? Because there's, you know, there's little critters. There's things that can come in that can, that can upset that. Uh, Song of Solomon talks about don't let the little foxes spoil the ground. Grapes, right? They get in, they eat them, they, they take care of it, and suddenly you have a ruined vineyard. So he puts these fences around. He puts, a, he puts a tower in the middle of it, and this is this idea of protection where somebody would stand and watch over it and make sure everything's going okay, and, you know, the wa- it's being watered, or there's, you know, I, I, I'm there at night to make sure nobody sneaks in. Okay, this is, this is what he would do. And then he, he digs a, a wine press, I mean, so that you can actually take the fruit of what he's given you and enjoy it. Now, most of us, I don't think, have a problem. Uh, you know, in, in religion, everybody thinks of, okay, yeah, I can see God as the tower builder. I can see God as the fence builder. He's trying to keep all these things out of my life. He's trying to say no and stop and don't and you can't. But very few of us see him as the wine press builder, 
the provider of joy. I want you to enjoy the fruit of the vineyard. I want you to enjoy life. Okay, this is God though. He is. He's that good, gracious, loving provider of joy. That's dad. That's our father. And this story is going to tell us that every person is going to give an account to that good, gracious, loving, heavenly father. That's the role of the owner in the story. Okay? All right, so then we t- we're told this man plants a vineyard. What's the vineyard? What are we supposed to see there? Well, certainly the application is what I've just told you, that, that, that it's everything. It's all that God has provided for us. But there's an immediate application in this. Remember, he's just argued with the leaders of, of, of Israel. And so uh, in Scripture, the vineyard very often refers to the nation of Israel. Back in Isaiah chapter 5, you can read it at some point, but you see God basically likens Israel. God basically tells this story. The prophet Isaiah tells almost the same story. And he, he, he says, Israel, you're like a vineyard and I plant it and it's cultivated and I protect. And in return, what I want you to be is fruitful. In other words, I want, you to, I, I, I want that, that fruit to come back to me. What was he talking about? He's talking about the, I, I want you to glorify me. I, I want you to worship me. That's what the fruit of the life of the people of God is. That we live lives that bring glory to God. And the point of the vine and the vineyard is that God is the owner Okay, Israel, by the way, would have understood this, um, this analogy. This would not have been strange to them, the idea of a vineyard. I mean, when we see an eagle, a bald eagle, that's America. When Canadians see a maple leaf, that's Canada. When, when Jews see a vine, that's Israel. Okay, this was, this was very much a part of, of their thinking. So, so God is the, is the owner, and he plants, he fences, he builds a tower. He provides everything they need to flourish. And then he said, okay, in return for that, I want you to follow me. I want you to worship me. I want you to be fruitful. I want others to see you and hear about me, and, and, and I want you to produce spiritual fruit. I, I want you to become my people more and more like me because I've, I've done all this for you. And so you live in grateful response to that. Okay, so God is the owner. The people of God are the vineyard. That's the comparison we're supposed to draw. Who are the tenants, right? Because he says they plant a vineyard and then he leases it to the tenants and then he goes into another country. Well, okay, first of all, in Jesus' day, this illustration would have made perfect sense because this happened all the time. What you did is an owner, you know, a man might own a lot of land and he can't farm it all himself, so he would go and get it ready. He'd basically create, we would call it a turnkey operation, right? That is, he'd get everything set up, he plants, he tower, the vats, the fence, everything, hands it over to some tenants, say, all I'm asking you to do is keep it cultivated and then return to me some of the profits, some of the fruit. There ought to be some sort of percentage return to me. Okay, so, I mean, put it in modern day times, we might say a man owned a McDonald's franchise, right? Or, you know, whatever. And McDonald's essentially sets you up with all you need to run a successful business. We'd call it a turnkey operation. And in return, you run a profitable business. And what do you do? You pay McDonald's a percent of the profit and franchise fee. That, that's how it works. Okay? So, so, but in this case, in Mark chapter 12, The McDonald's franchise goes really, really well. People are getting fat and all this, and it's so successful. They're making so much money, they don't want to share. It's all ours. Hey, wait a second. We're doing all the work, and you're going to come and try to take some of this away from us. And we don't want to pay back to you, and, and you don't deserve anything, and they forget you know, that the golden arches are over and nobody be coming if those weren't there. They forget who set up the turnkey operation in the first place. And so they don't pay their rent. They don't give the owner his percentage. They get greedy. They get selfish. They rob from the owner. They're thieves. Just like you and me. Like, well, wait a second, Chris. I'm not a thief. Yes, you are. And so am I. What are we supposed to yield to God? Glory, living for him, right? He's the one who did it all. And what do we do? No, no, I did it. I'm a glory thief. I I take all the blessings of God and say, I did this, right? This This is of my doing. 
It's my house. It's my car. It's my career. I built this, right? So, so, I mean, I know President Obama got in trouble for saying you didn't build this. Well, okay, maybe rightly so in, his, in, his, in that instance. But listen, when it comes to your life and mine as Christians, we must say, we didn't build this. God did it. It's all owing to God. If there's any blessing, if there's any goodness in my life, God did it, and I, I, I give back to him, and I love him, and I, and I give him the glory due his name. That, that's the life of a Christian, God gave you physical ability. God put breath in your lungs. It's all owing to God. And yet in our fierce American independence, we say, no way, not even God gets his share. It's mine. So, so, you know, like the vineyard, we said the vineyard has sort of this broader application and then an immediate application in here. Well, I think it's the same thing. The tenants have this broader application and who are they? Uh, well, and they should say in the immediate uh, application is that they're the, the wicked, religious rulers of the day, the false prophets and teachers, whatever, that want to destroy Jesus. But man, we, we'll wriggle off the hook if that's all we do. This is, like, this is just about false prophets and, and religious leaders of the day. No, um, these are people who don't want to obey God. They don't want to listen. They want to do their own thing. That sounds very familiar to me. I don't know about you. So, so the broader application is that that's you and me. I'm a wicked tenant. You're a wicked tenant. That's what we're supposed to look in this passage and see. Why? Because I keep refusing to submit to his will. I keep fighting with Jesus. I don't want to obey. I don't want to listen. I mean, isn't this what's happening with these people? He keeps sending people. They don't want to listen. We may not come out and say, you know, I want to destroy Jesus. But we live like that. And we live like that. Is that any better than how they're acting. Like when we refuse to listen, we refuse to act like he doesn't exist in our lives. We pay no attention to Jesus, but maybe an hour a week. How are we different? So, so, so that's, uh, that's the tenants and that's you and me. Okay, but then he introduces us to another set of people. Look at, start reading in verse two. And when the season came, he sent a servant to the tenants to get from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. And they took him and beat him and sent him away and empty-handed. Again, he sent to them another servant. They struck him on the head and treated him shavefully. And he sent another, and him they killed. And so with many others, some they beat and some they killed. Now, who are these servants? Well, the, the servants are, again, immediate application. The, these are, these are the, the prophets of the Old Testament. These are the men uh, that, 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 that God sent to say to people, stop doing what you're doing. Worship God. Live for Jesus, right? Turn your hearts to God and, 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 and warning people and encouraging them and telling them this is what it means to be the people of God. You, you've got to live like this. And so God sent them over and over and over and over throughout Israel's history. And what'd they do? They got beat up. They got killed, many of them. I mean, the story of Jeremiah is just unbelievable. If you actually read it and listen to what's happening, God appears to Jeremiah and is like, Jeremiah, man, I'm going to make you a prophet to the nations and you're going to speak and you're going to floor people. I mean, people are just going to you know, fall before you because of the might of the words that I'm going to give you. And so Jeremiah's like, yeah, I love this sound. And so he goes out and starts preaching. And every time he opens his mouth, they beat the crap out of him and throw him in a ditch. And, and, and at one point he's like, God, did you lie to me? Because this is not what I thought, right? I thought I'd speak and they'd all fall over. God's like, no, 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 this is exactly what I intended for you. And so over and over and over, they kill some, they beat some, but here's what I want you to notice. God keeps sending them. How patient is God? How patient is God? I mean, he sends a servant to collect the rents, right? So just get it in your head, right? So there's this, and he's like, hey, 
I set up this operation over in that area. I want you to go. It sounds like things are going well. It's harvest season, so now it's time for you to collect some of the fruit, some of the profits from that. And so this servant goes, okay, sounds like a good deal. I mean, they all know the deal. They signed the lease agreement. They know what's happening. And so he goes and knocks on the door and says, hey, I'm here to collect the rent. Remember, you guys said that you'd, you'd manage this vineyard for the owner, and now I'm here on his behalf to collect it. And, and what happens? Things don't go well, right? He shows back up at the owner's house, and the owner's like, hey, how'd it go? And he pulls a stake off his eye. He's got a big red shiner and teeth missing. Not very well, master. They beat me. I hate these people, right? They're awful. Hey, that's the story of the prophets. Now, 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 what would you do? Okay, you're the owner. Well, look what God does. He sends another. Right? And then another, and then another. And every time they are beaten, killed, and it happens over and over and over and over again. Over what? A few thousand years. That is the character of God. I, I, I cannot imagine being this patient. And God is still this patient. He never gives up. He keeps pursuing. He keeps coming after you. And some of you have been warned over and over and over again. Well, Chris, a prophet's never come to me. Has a preacher? Has a parent? Has a friend? Has God sent circumstances into your life to warn you? Right? And he's done it all kinds of times, and you have rejected them all. And yet, God is still patient with you. This is amazing to me. Now, now let me ask you. If you had to put up with that kind of treatment, not just for a week or two weeks or six months, but six years, 60 years, 600 years, 6,000 years. Could we blame God if after all of his patience toward us, he decided enough? And now I'm going to close down the vats of my mercy and I'm going to start uncorking the vials of my wrath. Who would blame him? Because people do it all the time. But they don't do it legitimately. So you see what's happening here? God, here's, here's what God does. God makes you. He pours out his blessing on you. He's so merciful to you, right? He gives you mercy and grace and protection and provision. I mean, you're breathing right now. You got up this morning, and unlike the last, you know, feels like forever, it was cool in the morning. And I bet very few people in the morning got up this morning, went outside, breathed, and went, thank you, Jesus. But he did it for you. The sun rose again today. It shouldn't have. We should all be incinerated. But we weren't. I mean, think of this. We could go on and on. Think of all the things God does. He gives us drinks to enjoy. He puts flavors in our mouth. Like I got to eat my wife's chocolate chip cookies last night. I mean, God made that up. He gives us, he gives us sights to see. Like we go to places so that our jaws will drop open and we'll sit there and basically worship. Some of us don't even acknowledge that God did this. He gives us sexual intimacy, the greatest joy we can know on planet Earth. God does that. He gives us companionship. He does all these things and all of those things so that we would trace that blessing back to him, live for him, glorify him, and show his goodness and his generosity to other people. But what do we do? Right? Most often, we don't acknowledge God. Right? I'm not... I can't think of the last time I was sitting there eating chips and guacamole going, oh, thank you, Jesus. Lord, this is fantastic, right? <laughs> but I should. 
What do we do? We get greedy. We get selfish. We go, this is mine. I claim ownership. I did this. And we get religious and think that's good enough. And we get disobedient. We start loving all of our stuff and our lives more than we love the one who gave us all of that, who provided the vineyard, who provided so we would have our joy and he would receive glory. And we refuse to listen to the people that God sends us to remind us why we're here in the first place. You see this? And so who are we? Men, we're the wicked tenants. Right? We don't want to listen to God or to his servants. We don't want God to tell us we're wrong. We don't want to hear words like repent, turn around, stop doing what you... We don't want any demands being placed on us. And if God sends the Holy Spirit to convict us or a preacher to instruct us, we go, whatever, who are you to tell me? And we reject them. We stiffen our necks. And you know what? Or, or, we pretend to listen. We say amen. But it doesn't really make any difference. Like, I, I know, I know how this works, right? I've been doing this quite a while. And the truth of the matter is, if statistics are right, then about 10% of you maybe hear what's being said and actually do something about it. So God sends his servants. They get beat up. They get rejected. I'm like, nah, I don't want to hear. That, that's the servants. So... So who's the son? Class. The son is? There you go, good. So what does he do? I mean, look at this. Let's, let's go down. Verse six. He had still one other, a beloved son. Finally, he sent him to them saying, They'll respect my son. I want you to stop and think about this for a moment. This is, now this should echo something, right? Beloved son, you heard this before? You heard it back when Jesus got baptized. When he raises, comes out of the water, it says, God shows up and says, this is my beloved son. And he's pleased with him. So Jesus is saying, okay, this is what's happening right now. He sends his beloved son, and he says to his son, go to the vineyard and get what is rightfully mine. And, 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 and look, where is he sending him? He's sending him to a place that every person he's ever sent has been struck, beaten, killed, battered, whatever. And, oh, oh now I'm going to send my son. What kind of father would do that? Are you dad? Any dads in here? You, uh, there's a lot of dads. You, 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 you look at that and go, there's no way. Like, after all that, I got four kids. I'm sending one of my children to go collect rent. Not a chance. Because that's sending them into harm's way. Exactly. Exactly. And God does it. And the son goes. Willingly. And what happens? He comes. And do you see what's happening here? He comes as a mediator between wicked, sinful, rebellious people and a righteous, good, gracious owner. Sound familiar at all? The son and the father have done nothing wrong. They have fulfilled their part of the bargain. And yet the son comes as a mediator to help and to serve and to reconcile. This is why I'm here. I just want to see things made right between you and the owner. Then what do they do? (laughs) Utter rejection. Say, let's keep reading. Verse 7, but those tenants said to one another, this is the heir. 
come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. And they, t- ours, and they took him, killed him, threw him out of the vineyard. So this is amazing. They, they, they go, okay, so here he comes, and let's do this because then the inheritance will be ours. What a window into our hearts. What, what, what's happening? No, no, no. We don't want to listen to God. We, wanna, we don't want to, we, we want to kill Jesus because we want to live for ourselves. We don't want the burden of having to answer to someone else's authority. We, we, so so we, we don't want to have to be accountable to some higher uh, authority. So, so if we eliminate Jesus, if we get rid of God in our lives, then he has no claim on us. So we don't have to live for him. We don't have to obey him. We're not accountable to him. We keep everything. God gets nothing. Charles Spurgeon said, and I think this is exactly right, self lies at the bottom of all rejection of Christ. Self. Why do people reject Christ? I don't want anybody having authority over me. Why do I reject? No, I'm going to close my ears to the truth. Why do you reject Christ? Because you. You're at the bottom. Let's say, well, Chris, I didn't kill Jesus. All right, well, I get, I, I know you weren't there 2,000 years ago and nailing him to a cross, but you understand you can do virtually what you did not do actually. And here's what I mean by that. Like the tenants, you can elevate yourself above the will of God. Like the tenants, you can reject those that God sends to you. Like the tenants, you can deny the Son of God. Like the tenants, you can live wholly indifferent to Jesus. Like the tenants, you can mistreat him, and you can treat him as though he doesn't exist. You can even say, you can come to church in a sense and say, I like Jesus, and I like the gospel, and I like Christian stuff, and then not at all live under his authority or pay your rent, the glory due to his name. How are you different? You killed him. You see, the Bible says this very clearly, that Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. There's not anybody that has ever walked planet Earth that Jesus did not die. The reason for his death was not them. That's you and me. He he died because of me. He died because of you. I killed him. You killed him. And so his blood is on our hands. Now, how would you feel? Okay, here again, you got to get into the story. How would you feel if someone murdered your child? I mean, just imagine the horror of that. Policeman walking up to your door. Why are you here? I'm here to tell you your child was just murdered. And this wasn't just some random murder, by the way. This wasn't a drive-by shooting. They got murdered by the people that you have spent years and years being patient with and reaching out to and trying to help and reconcile with. And what, how have they returned it? They've stolen from you. They've robbed you. They've mistreated you. They've ignored you. They've talked evil about you. And then you cap it all off and they murder your kid. Do you feel a little bit of like, oh my God, this is awful. And if you feel that even slightly, then you can start to see what Jesus wants you to see, something from God's perspective. You see this? Now you know how God feels. See, I told you, listen, Jesus wants to connect with our emotions, our affections. He, he wants us to feel something in this story and, 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 and see how different God's perspective is. This is how God sees people that have rejected every attempt of his to be gracious to you. Say, we have this crazy notion. Talk to anybody. Describe God to me. He's just love. God's love. He is, by the way, okay? But we make him out to be this one-dimensional hippie that is just love, and it's just love at all costs. It's love that has no edges to it. 
Now, now, now here, here, here's the deal. So, so God never gets angry, apparently. He never judges. Hell is basically a place that exists only for, you know, this cadre of really bad guys in history that we all know about. You know, Stalin and, and Hitler and Nero and maybe Alexander the Great's there and maybe, you know, Osama bin Laden, right? We, we, they're there. But nobody else is. I've told you before, I have never been to a funeral yet where the guy stands up and goes, y'all just need to know he's in hell. Okay, I'm pretty sure of this because he got drunk every weekend, cheated on his wife, beat his kids. But you know what's going to happen at that funeral? Somebody's going to stand up and go, oh, but he had a good heart. Somebody's going to stand up and go, oh, yeah, but he's in a better place. This doesn't make sense to me at all. This this makes no logical sense. See, how can we call God a God of love, which he is, if he won't love his son enough to be angry at his murder and do something about it? Listen, if your your kid got murdered and I saw you just kind of like, hey, you know, it is what it is, people would not respect you they would think, you're, you're crazy. How can you respond so dispassionately to this? See, see, I don't think you want a God that is loving at all costs without wrath. We were talking about this this week as a staff. And we were looking at the attributes of God. And I said to the staff, has anybody, have you ever worshipped God because of his wrath? (laughs) Have you ever thought about that? Dear God, I praise you that you're a wrathful God. It sounds weird, doesn't it? But if it's in God, apparently it's praiseworthy. Now, how so? Here's what I'd say. Don't, Don't tell the girl who's been raped, that God is not a God of wrath. Don't tell the father whose son is murdered that God is not a God of wrath. Don't don't, don't tell the families of those 2,000 people that got killed in the Twin Towers 11 years ago that God is not a God of wrath. If he's all just, you know, God doesn't do anything about it. You know, he's just, what kind of God do we serve if all he does is look at the injustice and the sin and the horrible things and the things that were done to his son and just go, hey, I just want to love. Let's kind of ignore all that bad stuff. I'm just a loving God. I don't want to worship a God like that. For God to be loving, he has to hate sin. And if he doesn't hate sin, we have to wonder how loving he is. One of the things this story tells us is that God loves his son so much that he hates that he got murdered. His beloved son is murdered and God says, I'm going to do something about that. So look at verse 9. What does he say? Okay, we're asked this question. What will the owner of the vineyard do? Now stop right there. What would you do? You've reached out over and over and over again. Finally, you send one of your children. They kill your child. What would you do? You're the owner of the universe. Well, I'll tell you what I'd do. I'd take this little globe called Earth. I'd dip it in gasoline, light it on fire, punt it to the other side of the world, and then just crush it. Right? In Luke... When he tells this story, he's going to end it by talking about the stone the builders rejected and woe to him on whom the stone falls. It'll crush you. But 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 look what happens. He he says he's going to come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. You know what? Some people refuse to believe, don't want to believe, teach against the fact that God would create hell. I I have no problem with hell. I have a bigger problem with heaven. (laughs) Hell makes perfect sense to me. Heaven doesn't. Like, Like, look at 
think God gives you everything you need. He puts breath in your lungs, right? He blesses you. He gives you all kinds of things. He, he loves you. And yet in return, you ignore him. You ignore every attempt of his to be kind to you. You don't listen to him. You shut him out of your life. You, you act as though God doesn't exist. Jesus is not anything. I don't care. The death of, cross, cross, of Christ means nothing to me. And we refuse and we totally reject him. We act like he doesn't exist. And in the end, we murder his son, Hell makes perfect sense to me. God is totally justified in what he would do. And I don't think hell's a surprise ending. I don't think anybody's going to be in hell and go, wow, this, uh, this doesn't make sense to me. I didn't see this coming. I really don't believe that. I, I, think, I, think, I think it's like a criminal. Okay, who robs a bank and then robs another one, another one, another one, another one, another one. Finally, the FBI catches up to him. You know, hey, dude, you know, put him in handcuffs, throws him in the back of the car. He goes to jail for the rest of his life. I don't think that criminal is sitting there going, wow, I didn't see this coming. I had no idea jail was the end of this deal. Right? No, I think probably he and everybody else says, you know, that makes perfect sense. You know what doesn't make sense? the magnanimous mercy of God. That doesn't make sense to me. Just like, just like I don't think people are going to be in hell going, wow, I don't get it. I, I don't know. No, no, no. I think that everybody who goes to heaven is going to fall to their knees and go, I can't believe this is happening to me. God, after all I did, after all the sin and all the rejection, and God, you kept pursuing me, and you kept coming after me, and you kept sending people to speak into my life, and you kept loving me, and you extended me the hand of friendship over and over, and how many times that I rejected it, and yet your patience, you kept loving me, and you offered me not just the hand of friendship, but the hand of adoption, and that doesn't make sense to me. And Jesus says, man, I'm going to destroy these tenants. But now look at this little ray of hope right here in verse 10 and 11. Jesus ends it with this little summary statement. Have you not read the scripture? He's quoting, by the way, Psalm 118. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And this was the Lord's doing. And it is marvelous in our eyes. Did you just hear what he just said? The stone the builders rejected. So there they are building the temple. And they see this stone. They're like, ah, it's a piece of junk. They throw it out. These are expert builders. And they start looking at it. They start surveying it. And they realize, oh, no. We threw that stone out. This is the very one we needed to actually create squareness in the foundation, right? This is the one we needed for it to build everything on top of it. And it says that that rejection, verse 11, was the Lord's doing. And he ends it in a way that Luke doesn't end it. He says, this is marvelous in our eyes. What's happening? He, he, Jesus, Jesus looks and goes, this is amazing. It's for those who are watching this happen, it is marvelous because suddenly you realize that this rejection, the very thing that was rejected has now become the thing that I should build my life on and this is an absolute amazing marvel. I'm astonished, I'm stunned that that rejected thing is a thing that I now put my hope in. Can I, can I say something about current events right now? Isn't it fascinating that Islam is up in an uproar ostensibly, whether you want to argue with it or not, but ostensibly because of a video that mocked their prophet, humiliated their prophet. Do you understand, Christian, that we glory in the humiliation of ours. We would not be Christians today if it weren't for the rejection, humiliation, and brutal death of our Savior. How different 
these two world religions are. <laughs> and you ought to see our humiliated God and like Paul say, I, I glory in that. You know, Islam will say, he didn't die. No way was Christ crucified. And the Christian says, oh, oh yes, in fact, if he did not, I'm still in my sin. And we glory in the cross. This is the gospel. What's happening in this is the gospel. All this rejection, and yet, in verse 10, hey, guys, Hey, guys, you're going to reject me. I'm going to die because of you. But I, here's my prayer. Some of you are going to wake up and realize that guy we just crucified, the one we rejected, oh, my God, he's the one I should build my life on. See, that's the gospel. You murdered God's beloved son, and so did I. His blood is on our hands. We've all sinned. And so what does God do? Could have just incinerated us. He sends his son to be rejected, to die. God lays on Jesus all of our sin, all of our shame, and he dies not only for our sins, but the sins of the whole world. And then he comes along and Jesus goes, hey, Chris, you understand the wages of your sin means death for you. You get this, Chris? Yeah. Then let's make a deal. I already died. How about you say you're sorry, and I'll credit my death to your account. And now you don't have to die, and you don't have to experience the wrath of God. <laughs> you want to accept that offer, Chris? And then God steps in and goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Chris, by the way, if you'll accept that offer, you won't be my enemy anymore. And it's not just a cessation of hostilities. Chris, I'll do more than that. I'll adopt you into my family. I'll call you by my name. Guess what, Chris? You'll become one of my beloved sons. Because my son died for you. You pick back up that stone the builders rejected, Chris, and you start building your life on that. Do you see the hope in this? This is unbelievable. And this is why I say, this is marvelous. See, if you'll turn from your sin and you'll accept what Jesus offers, you'll be forgiven. No matter what you've done, you, you, you can't look at God and say, but you don't know, I've done this and this. Have you killed his son the way you have? You've, there's no greater sin you've committed, and he still offers it to you. You've jacked up your life, and Jesus says, well, guess what? I give you a chance to rebuild it all over with a new cornerstone that'll square it out. Some of you feel like your lives are just shifty and shaky, and they have no support to them. And Jesus comes along and says, let me be the cornerstone. Let me, let me build the foundation, okay? And then we're going to build on top of that. See, here's the thing. You need Jesus. I make no apologies for that. In fact, I'm telling you, I say that for you. <laughs> you need to turn from your sin, your rebellion, the fact that you have rejected him, thrown him out of the vineyard, rejected every offer he's ever given you. You need to say, I'm sorry that I've acted like the wicked tenant and I want to accept your offer of forgiveness. And if you're a Christian, you look at your life and go, you know what, I can see some areas where I'm out of alignment with the cornerstone and I need to put my, like, I need to by the grace of God where, where he needs to come in and, 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 and realign my life. And you repent of that. And the Bible says... Nobody's without sin, okay? So we're all clear on this. Everybody in this room, we're jacked up, messed up people, okay? And the Bible says this, if you'll just confess your sin, right? Right, you're not hiding anything. If you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you your sin 
and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Don't you want to be clean? Don't you hate that feeling? I, I, I hate it. Don't you want to know there's this great doctrine in the Bible called expiation. God cleanses you. <laughs> cleanses you. It doesn't just say, hey, I'll just act like it didn't exist. No, I will cleanse you from your unrighteousness. That's what God offers to you. So you know what? God is the gracious Father. We are the wicked, rebellious tenants. Jesus Christ is the beloved, rejected Son. And if you'll place your faith in that beloved Son, it'll be marvelous. God will rearrange your whole life. Let's pray. Father, I never get over the gospel. It is not, it's not the infancy of our Christianity. It is all of our Christianity. It's something we will unpack until the day that you bring us to heaven. And we never outgrow it. And so I pray, God, um, for those of us who are Christians, Lord, let it ring true again and soften our hearts to see your magnificent mercy. I pray for people here today. They could look at their life and say, hey, I'm religious. I try to be moral. But at the bottom of that, God, is a rejection of the cross of Christ because they're saying, I can earn God's favor. God, I pray that what they'd see you're offering to them is not religion. You're offering to them a relationship of a son, of a daughter, that you will forgive all their sins against you, including their pride and feelings that they can earn their way to heaven, and, and, and you'll adopt them into your family. And so I pray today, people in this room would accept your gracious offer of forgiveness. They would say, I'm sorry, I've lived as a wicked tenant. They would turn from that and they would turn to your loving, gracious, good arms that wants to put us into the vineyard to be protected, provided for, and to know the joy of living for Jesus. Father, help us, I pray. We love you, we thank you, and we ask this in Jesus' name.